Hello everyone and welcome to MedTube channel presenting another video on respiratory alkalosis. Respiratory alkalosis is defined as a decrease in the PaCO2 which is the partial pressure of the arterial carbon dioxide secondary to hyperventilation which is the exact opposite to respiratory acidosis and the normal PaCO2 is 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury. Respiratory alkalosis is generally classified into acute and chronic depending on the duration of symptoms and the response or the compensation to the primary disturbance which will be explained hopefully in the next video and there are four main mechanisms by which respiratory alkalosis occurs and the first one is direct respiratory center stimulation in the brainstem and the second one is hypoxemia which activates the chemoreceptors and therefore causing hyperventilation and the third one is cardiopulmonary disease regardless of hypoxemia and that's due to the pressure and the stretch receptors present in the airway the lungs and the heart causing graphene flex hyperventilation and the last one is the mechanical hyperventilation great so now let's start with the etiologies and again we have the four etiologies with the first one being respiratory center stimulation the second one is hypoxemia the third one is cardiopulmonary diseases and the last one is mechanical hyperventilation so starting with the respiratory center stimulation we have a variety of causes starting with CNS disorders which are thought to cause a local irritation to the respiratory center in the brainstem and then we have hepatic failure and liver failure is thought to cause hyperventilation through accumulation of progesterone, ammonia, glutamine, and VIP, vasoactive intestinal peptide, all of which directly stimulate the respiratory center. And then we have the sepsis, and sepsis stimulates the respiratory center through endotoxins and other inflammatory mediators. And then we have pregnancy, which has increased progesterone levels, and progesterone stimulates the respiratory center. And then we have the anxiety, the panic disorders, and pain, all of which increase sympathetic stimulation, therefore causing hyperventilation. Or it could be due to hyperventilation syndrome, which is idiopathic attacks of hyperventilation, usually associated with anxiety anxiety and panic disorders and finally we have various drugs which directly stimulate the respiratory center and the first drug is aspirin and aspirin causes respiratory alkalosis primarily in adults due to direct stimulation of the respiratory center and it's also important to know that aspirin also causes later in phase 3 a high anion gap metabolic acidosis through uncoupling of the oxidative phosphorylation and inhibition of the Krebs cycle both of which cause accumulation of organic acids lactic acid and keto acid and then we have progesterone which we have already said that it also directly stimulates the respiratory center and then we have theophylline which is thought to increase the catecholamines release and catecholamines will increase the beta adrenergic activity and therefore causing respiratory center stimulation and then we have the catecholamines themselves causing respiratory center stimulation and finally some psychotropics also have the potential to stimulate the respiratory center and now with a second category of respiratory alkalosis which is hypoxemia and hypoxemia could be further categorized into acute and chronic causes with the acute being primarily pulmonary causes such as pneumonia, pulmonary edema, asthma, pulmonary embolism, pneumothorax, foreign body aspiration and some other causes which are not mentioned here all of which impair the gas exchange and therefore causing hypoxemia and for the chronic causes we have heart failure, severe anemia, high altitude and interstitial lung disease all of which also impair gas exchange and therefore cause hypoxemia and hypoxemia causes hyperventilation through stimulation of the peripheral chemoreceptors in the carotid bodies now please understand the following important concept most of these pulmonary conditions will first cause respiratory alkalosis in a mild or early disease through stimulation through hypoxemia as we have said however when the disease progresses and becomes more severe the lungs will start to decompensate and undergo respiratory failure and therefore respiratory acidosis will result and that's why most of these conditions were mentioned in the previous video in the respiratory acidosis one and now with a third category which is cardiopulmonary diseases and in this category we have various pulmonary and cardiac causes which cause hyperventilation through various stretch and pressure receptors present in the lungs and the heart which cause reflex hyperventilation irrespective of the presence of hypoxemia and many of those causes are the same as those in hypoxemia such as pneumonia, pulmonary edema, emphysema, pulmonary fibrosis, pneumothorax, flyal chest, and pulmonary embolism, and for the cardiac causes such as CHF, pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary stenosis, and mitral valve disease, 
all of which cause stimulation of those stretch or pressure receptors in the lungs or the heart, and therefore causing hyperventilation. And the last category, which is mechanical hyperventilation, which is simply excessive mechanical ventilation in intubated patients. This is all for the causes of respiratory alkalosis in summary, and now let's move to the management of respiratory alkalosis, starting with history taking. And we start by asking the patients if they have any neurological symptoms secondary to cerebral vasoconstriction, so they could have dizziness, confusion, syncope, or even seizures. And there are other neurological symptoms which occur usually in hyperventilation syndrome, and those neurological symptoms are like paresthesias and circumoral numbness. And then we ask about any cough or sputum production, or dyspnea or fever, all of which could indicate different pulmonary causes. And then we ask about any history of head trauma or chest trauma, which could indicate pneumothorax. And then inquire about the past medical history, about any known COPD or lung diseases, or anemia, or if the patient lives at high altitude, and about any liver diseases, heart diseases, any known anxiety or panic disorders, and finally any ingestion of aspirin, progesterone, or theophylline. So this is the high yield history required in respiratory alkalosis. And now with a physical examination, starting with measuring the vital signs, and of course we would expect the respiratory rate to be above 16 breaths per minute, and of course we're interested in the heart rate, the temperature, and the blood pressure, all of which aid in the differential diagnosis. And then we assess the patient for any obvious neurological signs such as syncope or seizures or decreased level of consciousness and therefore a GCS would be required and then we would conduct a complete chest and cardiovascular examinations both of which are very essential to look for any underlying lung or heart diseases as hypoxemia causes are very common causes of respiratory alkalosis and then look for any cyanosis which also indicates hypoxemia and then we would conduct a quick abdominal examination looking for any signs of liver disease and finally we would elicit the schwastic and Trousseau signs looking for any hypocalcemia as the alkalosis associated with respiratory alkalosis will decrease the free ionized calcium because more calcium is bound to albumin in alkalosis and therefore we would have symptoms of hypocalcemia. Nevertheless, the total body calcium will of course remain normal. And now with the investigations. And we would begin with the quickest investigation which is the pulse oximetry looking for any hypoxemia. And we would also perform a bedside spirometry to have a general idea about the pulse pulmonary function and then we would collect an arterial blood specimen performing an ABG arterial blood gases to look at the pH and for any ongoing compensation and we would also measure the AA gradient if the patient has hypoxemia as it helps in differentiating different types of hypoxemia and we would also measure the CBC looking for any anemia and looking at the WBCs as WBCs will be increased in chest infections or in sepsis and then we would look at the metabolic profile and we would expect to see a slight hyponatremia hypo kalemia and hypophosphatemia as alkalosis causes a minor shift of the sodium the potassium and the phosphate into the cells and of course we would expect to see a decrease in the free calcium because of increased binding to albumin but the total body calcium will be normal a blood culture may be needed if sepsis is suspected and culture of any relevant fluid such as the CSF or the urine etc we will also measure the beta HCG in females of the child bearing age to exclude pregnancy and if the patient is suspected to have ingested some drug we would also perform a drug screen especially if it's aspirin or theophylline and if required we would also do the thyroid function tests looking for hyperthyroidism as hyperthyroidism can also cause hyperventilation which we haven't actually mentioned in the previous slides and hyperthyroidism causes respiratory alkalosis by the direct stimulation of the chemoreceptors and finally we would definitely do a chest radiograph looking for any chest or heart changes and if the results were inconclusive then we would go for a CT scan and now with the treatment of respiratory alkalosis and the treatment is basically to treat the underlying cause of the hyperventilation for example if it were a pneumothorax then we would insert a chest tube if it were an infection then we would give antibiotics if it were a hyperventilation syndrome then we would best manage the stress and educate the patient about breathing retraining which is usually by maximally exhaling and to perform an abdominal breathing as using the diaphragm slows down the respiratory rate and gives a more sense of self-control during the acute episodes of hyperventilation. However, the commonly known treatment, which is rebreathing into a 
paper bag is not recommended anymore because it has shown to increase the mortality rate in these patients as many of those hyperventilation syndrome patients have been misdiagnosed and the true diagnosis then turns out to be a pulmonary embolism or pneumothorax and rebreathing into a paper bag will cause hypoxia and increase the mortality rate in these patients. And overall, respiratory alkalosis itself is rarely life-threatening, so your whole management is basically to treat the underlying cause. However, if the alkalosis goes too high, then we would consider to sedate the patient to stop the hyperventilation. This is all for respiratory alkalosis in summary. I really hope that you have enjoyed this video, and hopefully I'll see you again with the next video on approach to acid-based disturbances. Thank you very much.